Joining me now is the man behind that documentary. Tom Brokaw is the iconic American journalist, news anchor, and author who spent four decades covering China and U.S.-China relations and has had a unique perspective on China's growth and modernization. Tom Brokaw, welcome to The Heat. It's a delight to have you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I want to get to the documentary, but first let's take a step back. 1975, you follow uh, President Ford to China. Right. That's a long, long flight. I'm sure the wheels are turning. You have kind of thoughts of what China's going to look like, what you're going to get when you get there. How did that square with what you actually saw when you got well, there? Well, you know, we'd had a, obviously we'd had some preparation because President Nixon had gone away, seen all that television coverage. Things were beginning to kind of leak out of there. So when we arrived, I think our mindset, to, I'm speaking collectively for the White House press, was in pretty good shape. But what was stunning, once we got into the interior of the city, was just how 19th century it was. I think we were not prepared for that. The hotels were last built in 1923, 1924. Um, they reminded me of the hotel that my father's family owned in northern South Dakota, you know, a little railroading hotel. They were kind of musty. Um, everything was primitive. And then everywhere we went, because Westerners were so unusual in those days in Beijing, you know, these great hordes of people would stop and stare at us. I went out for a run. I was running a lot of those days, and I came back ran through the hutongs, the little communal villages where they cook with soft coal. And apparently I had soot coming out of every <laughs> opening in my head. And the White House doctor came to me and said, you can't do that anymore. Oh my uh, gosh. Uh, because he said, it's really dangerous to be breathing that air. Geez. Well, let me ask you about that trip because, uh, you know, history at the time, everyone kind of looked at the trip as it was just kind of a thud. Uh, was that your sense too that, uh, or did it help to move the momentum forward in a sense? Well, I think later it did, but, uh, you know, Mao was still alive. He was at the end of his run. Uh, Deng Xiaoping had made a comeback. He was more prominent in that trip than he had been earlier, obviously. They were emerging from the Cultural Revolution. Deng was famous for saying it's not whether the cat is black or white, but whether it can catch mice. That was a whole new attitude about how you could deal with the Chinese economy. So I, I always thought it was an intersection between China's hard party past and what turned out to be its future. Uh, the press was very unhappy because there didn't seem to be anything of substance going on. And that was in part because the Chinese were in a holding pattern. You know, Mao was still there. The big meeting with President Ford was with Mao. Joe was still around. Uh, I was in a meeting with uh, Deng Xiaoping twice, which is a great privilege. I was the pool reporter when President Ford met with him. And you could see that there was a whole different kind of um, attitude on the part of this man. He was speaking in Chinese only, but he was very sassy with the American reporters. He was giving us a bad time about writing about his spitting and his smoking. And I talked to him about playing bridge, which he liked to do, a little diminutive man. But once the meeting began, he was in charge, and you saw this is somebody unique. Let me, um, I, I want to play a little clip from Ron Nesson, an old NBC guy who was right. the press secretary, and, and I want to get your thoughts after this. So let's listen to what he has to say. One of the biggest problems that the White House had with Ford's four-day visit to China was that the Chinese would never tell us in advance what the schedule was. And the Chinese demanded that we not release any news about the content of Ford's conversations with the lower level Chinese officials. Now, these and other restrictions that were imposed by the Chinese made it impossible for me to do my job of keeping reporters informed. Uh, so a tough job for him, uh, you guys wanting to beat up on him, and, and how tough was it for you if, if nothing's coming out? Well, the one thing you could fall back on was that China was still uh, so new to America and so unique and so exotic in a way that even if you didn't have substantive stuff, you could talk about what it looked like in the streets and the bicycle traffic and, and what was going on at the Great Wall. I was with Gary Trudeau a lot, the Doonesbury cartoonist, and uh, we think we were the first ones to throw a frisbee on the Great Wall. I'm not sure that that will end up in the history books. <laughs> Chinese were not happy about that. They saw it as a kind of a sacrilegious act, I think. Then I had a friend back here who was at the Smithsonian and asked me to get a pine cone from one of the pine trees growing at the base of the wall because it was unique to that part of China. He was an agronomist. So I brought back pine. I was up crawling up in these trees getting pine cones, and the Chinese were not happy about that. 
putting them in a moist bag, bringing them back, and we actually uh, got them germinated and grew little pine trees from the base of the Chinese oh, wall. Wow. So there were those distractions that had nothing to do with big Sino-Soviet differences or the United States and its relationship. We saw a clip uh, earlier in the broadcast of uh, your documentary in 1983. So, so move us ahead. Uh, that's 75. How did how had China changed when you went back? And by the way, I think the documentary is extraordinary. It kind of peels back the curtain. You get to see China and the Chinese people in so many different ways. By the way, it, it ran two hours in prime time and won the night. Uh, now, wow. I don't think that that would happen anymore, in part because there was this enormous curiosity in this country. We had a little bit of what I call the Cupid doll syndrome, however. You know, the Chinese, they're just so interesting looking and uh, in their little blue uniforms. And of course, it was a very cold-blooded regime in so many ways as well. When I was back there in 83, things had begun to change. Uh, there was a, they were more free to talk about what was going on. I had a minder with me from the foreign ministry. He went with me everywhere. He was a real intellectual. And we'd have very quiet conversations about what was going on in China, what his hopes were. Um, when I had been there with President Ford, we thanked our minder at the end of the week who had been on the bus with us. He gave me the most cold-blooded stare you can imagine and said, I didn't do this for you, I did this for my chairman, Chairman Mao. Mm. By the time I got back there, that had changed. I, you know, I rode the trains, as you saw in the uh, documentary across China. I could go back to third-class compartments with my interpreter and talk to nurses and peasants and other people, and they were free to express whatever they were thinking. They were much more interested in me uh, and what I, how did I get there, for one thing. So it was a great, great trip. 